Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz interview series with Jazz Woodwinds player Brian Lantris. He talked about his new 2022 CD called Red List. It's his 11th album as a leader and second on Palmetto Records, and it's dedicated to the preservation of endangered species. Spreading awareness of this tragic global situation is part of the impetus for this album. We cover this in the modern COVID world we are all now emerging from, along with some more. Enjoy the story. Hi, Joe. How are you? Joe DeMiro, what's up, man? How you doing? I'm doing great, thanks. Good. Hey, thanks for taking a minute out. I appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. I love the new album, man. I leaped on that thing and got it on the show real fast. Oh, thank you. You know, I think, you know, there's several components that probably go into this, and, and I'm going to start at the top with what's been really in front of our faces for the last couple of years has been COVID, and I'm curious how this project was motivated by what we went through on this planet for those last, those couple of years and how yeah. maybe that motivated and shaped how this came out. You know, really what happened was I think for a lot of people, it made me uh, thinking about things differently. And I was looking at the larger, larger situation in our world and what what can I do to make something make this better instead of instead of taking and you know I have a I have a good friend who's a who's an artist uh, a metal sculptor and and he he always talks about how he wants to to give back something instead of just taking instead of just con- constantly taking from the earth what can we do that's going to give back in some way and uh, since I've been a an animal lover my entire life. I, I wasn't necessarily thinking about a new album, but when during during that entire time, I was uh, I started researching a lot more just about climate change and things things that we can do as individuals to help uh, stop that or at least slow it down. Uh, and one of the things that came up was the amount of animals that have been going extinct uh, from from not only climate change, but of course, animal interaction and uh, this, those, that entire uh, subject matter was, was so fascinating to me that once I started getting into it, I started reading uh, about all these specific animals that were going extinct. And I felt like I I just, I wanted to do something to, to help build awareness, uh, try to try to do something that could maybe help them. And, you know that came out of I think just the the idea of of like I said when the pandemic hit a lot of people really kind of started thinking about really truly what's what's important in our lives and to me uh, I'm I'm very very grateful that I I get to play music and and write it and perform with people and tour and uh, but fundamentally I I want to do something more significant as a human than uh, simply playing music, if that makes sense. You know, I want to do something that was uh, a deeper cause for me uh, spiritually and uh, just just as a human. So that just it just seemed to be uh, the right timing for me to have an awakening. And I guess I got that from, you know, I get a lot of discs in the mail in my capacity as, uh, you know, with, with the radio station. And I could tell immediately by the artwork and just, you know, knowing your work and by the way that you presented it, there was an extra level of moxie that went behind this. My question to you is, you know, going into it from an artistic perspective, from cover to song, how did you approach this? How did you want this to ultimately come out the way it did? I researched about each animal first. I found the the most endangered species, and it started with, it actually started with eight. And it just kept expanding. I kept learning about these animals, and I just I ended up with uh, with thirteen animals. And when I I was researching their habitat, their uh, the problems that are that they ha- are facing, uh, whether it's human encroachment into their environment, uh, whether it's uh, actual introduction of uh, an unusual species to that that region from humans. Uh, there's all these different factors. The more that I was researching about these animals, I, uh, I I really just got very into that. And what happened was I decided that I was going to make this album, and I reached out to friends 
and I told them what I wanted to do and why. And they were all very behind the project at that point. They all just, they agreed and wanted to learn more and we were learning together. And, you know, one of the, one of the people that I, I didn't know, uh, I didn't know him personally, but I knew his music was Jeffrey Keezer. And, uh, Jeff is, is a, a brilliant artist and he's, He's someone that when I was uh, thinking about what kind of keyboardist I needed for this project, I needed someone that would be able to play piano extremely well, but also be a master of synthesizers and Rhodes and organ and all these things. And I, when I told Jeff, uh, when I talked to him on the phone, I said what the project was about. He said, you know, that, that sounds fascinating to me. Can you please send me some music that you're writing or, you know, that we're going to be playing. And I had to tell him the truth, which was, I haven't written a note yet. I want to, I want to line up the artist first and then, and then I'll write. And so, so that's what I did. And then, uh, he, he, you know, he, uh, Jeff had heard my earlier work and he liked it and he understood the message. So he was, he agreed without hearing anything and said, okay, well, send me what, what you can as soon as you can, of course. Uh, but after all the research that I did, I just sat down at the piano and, and I wrote all the music and it came out in about 10 days. And uh, there were several days where I wrote uh, two songs. And so in that, uh, and it was, it was, um, I think artistically it felt very, uh, very honest and very uh, pure. And I didn't, I didn't really have the time to even consider any of the things that can maybe cloud one's judgment or uh, maybe filter uh, your, your thoughts. And I, I think for me, I just sat down and played and I had lyrics for some of the tunes I had, uh, ju but the purpose was there. And when I sat down, the music just, just, uh, it was, it was almost like me trying to catch it as fast as, as I heard it. So uh, it, it came out and I didn't, I didn't filter it. I didn't change it. I didn't, um, I, I felt like it was honest to the creatures. It was honest to the purpose. And therefore I just got behind it completely. And, you know, uh, the, the compositional process for me has been, um, I, I try, I try to not judge it at any time. And what I mean is that I don't, I don't feel like I write, or that I wrote any of this music, I feel like maybe I discovered it. It was already there. And I tapped into something where I, I heard it and, and then wrote it down. I transcribed it, but it's from another place. And so I don't, I don't ever feel ownership on my music. Uh, my, you know, the music that people would say yeah, I wrote, I don't really feel like I wrote it. And in this album, uh, that was even more so. I felt like it was, uh, it was just coming through. I was lucky that I grabbed it in the air at that moment. And, and that was what was representative of the orangutan uh, and the snow leopard and whatever the given animal was for that day, for that time that the music just came out and I, I didn't question it. And I think that's something I've been uh, trying to do for a long time, but I feel like as an artist, the more honest I am, uh, the, the better the art comes out. Uh, if I if I ever question it, then th that's problematic uh, because that's that's filtering what's going on. And, and for me, if the purpose is correct, then uh, the the music will will follow that as well. You know, I just took a trip out to San Diego. It was a long trek from Kansas City out west, and I was telling my wife that I always wanted to see a California condor. And I I remember they used to talk about how they would build these massive nests and. Um, they're endangered, and it just blew my mind. Yeah. And I was just thinking, obviously, when you're behind the wheel, you start thinking about things. And I've always found that one of the ugliest parts of humanity is that, that you know, people in positions that can put pollutants and different things into the air can just be okay with things that existed billions and billions of years before is just never being around anymore. It's just it's an unreal notion to me. It's, yeah, I'm with you 100%. It's, it's hard to grasp that that is the thought process that many people have and I, I i it's so unfamiliar and i can't even imagine thinking that way so it's it's hard to conceptualize but but it's absolutely true and 
you know, there's there's different levels of that. There's the there's the cat that actually signs the mm-hmm. bill, knowing that this may put the condor extinct, even though uh, whatever. And usually, unfortunately, it's it's financially driven, and that's uh, that's just a horrible, sad reality of of our our lives and a sad uh, attribute of humans. The other part of of this album and what's going on with the world to kind of make a slight departure here. You know, the jazz community was obviously affected. Clubs closed down. There was a lot of things. But, you know, a lot of musicians became better at promoting and doing production skills and things like that. So I'm curious, how did you change over this time and how you, as yourself with new skills and collectively as a community, how do you see this community rebounding and being stronger as a result? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Uh, I I think personally for me what happened was it made me question why, you know, the the big picture of, of what am I doing and what's what's the purpose. And uh, I, it seemed like a, a moment. I don't want to say it seemed like it was it, it's, it was a very long moment of uh, reflection uh, as to what uh, what I want to do and what I want to pursue. And once again, honesty just came in again where, you know, I choose some instruments that are not the um the most practical in the sense of if I want to tour with a rock and roll band, uh, if I want to play with a lot of different groups, they're not going to call me to play bass flute on one of their gigs. Uh, and it's so there's that moment of do I practice this instrument that I know will give me practical work or do I follow what I feel is my spiritual path uh, to to grow? Uh, and for me, it just it just became more clear, and it was just I'm going to do what I think what, what feels best, and work as hard as I possibly can to make that work out in the in the world of finances and the world of uh, of music and art as a whole. Uh, I, I I've seen a lot of artists kind of go through the same thing where it just. It, it, people were either in it for the long haul and they're going to figure out their own path or maybe this isn't the way to go and they're going to choose a different route in their in their lives. Uh, so I, I've, I actually saw a lot of musicians leave New York, uh, which was sad, uh, and to see a lot of people that are now going into different careers altogether. Uh, it has been really hard. My, my favorite clubs in New York are gone uh and there's still some some great clubs but uh you know the jazz standard for instance was, was my favorite i mean i love playing there with my band I, I played there with a lot of different bands uh and that's uh and it's it's just gone you know uh there was fat cat uh another club where they had these great jam sessions they had late night stuff going on all the time uh they were very respectful to towards musicians it's gone. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of places. Things have changed. The landscape has changed. But uh, yeah, the the people that have have stuck around, uh, and I I have some friends that split and are back now. And I think it's made everyone uh, realize priorities. And with this record, that was one of the the beautiful attributes of it. Where when I when I called up my friends like Ron Blake, who's uh, the saxophonist, baritone saxophone on Saturday Night Live, uh, he's played in you know he played in Roy Hargrove's band for many years. He's been in Christian McBride's band for many years. And Ron is one of my best friends. And when when this project started getting going, when I I called out to Ron and said, Hey, uh, uh, you know, would you be interested in playing on this? And you know, here's what I'm doing. Here's what's going on. It, it, it's an immediate like, yes, of course, I want to. Uh, that has purpose. It has something greater than uh, just playing playing over a tune. Uh, so, I think the the camaraderie uh, was was really important in this album, and I think in the the jazz world altogether, where a lot of people are unifying and joining forces to try to keep moving forward and. Uh, that's been refreshing, and it's it's also been tough in in terms of uh, the clubs and who's playing where. And you know, some of the smaller clubs are now getting uh, people like Bram from Marsalis playing at them, which you know before he was playing at the you know the huge clubs, and now some of them that are still around aren't doing that as much. So it's it's a change, and everyone's still trying to find where the ground is, 
and uh, I think that's that's just the nature of it. Uh, but but gratefully and thankfully, a lot of things are coming back, and we're able to play a lot more, and uh, the audience has seen eager to hear it and that's and that's wonderful you know another part of what's going on you know from my perspective as a fan of jazz is that you know i think the audiences are different i think there's a different appreciation what are you noticing from fans and is it, is it a refreshing change i had a concert a, a week ago where uh there was about a thousand people and it was an outdoor concert and it was in reno which is is my hometown but i brought out my my new york band so i had billy hart and lonnie plaxico and ryan keberly uh and a bunch of other friends joining in from the west coast and what i noticed was the level of listening was pretty shocking to me and what i mean is that you know we finished one song and uh, I, I went into a, a solo uh, baritone saxophone, uh, basically an interlude in between the songs. I would have each one of the artists in the band play an interlude and, and just by themselves. And when I took a breath, you could hear a pin drop. I mean, the place was just absolutely silent. We're talking a, a huge outdoor venue with a lot of people and no one was saying anything. No, everyone was just listening, and that was uh, that was a powerful moment for me. Just to just to realize uh, the level of listening that was happening at that moment, and and I have to tell you that usually when when that uh, when I when I do something like that over the years, you can I can usually hear people talking. There, you know, most of the place is quiet but there's people that are the outliers or even if they're close up and they're, you know, you know, whatever they're talking about. And, but that was just, that was really fascinating to me that it's an outdoor venue. Uh, there's a ton of people and it was just absolute silence. And so that to me just seemed like, a, a the audience was very uh, into it, very engaged and really, really paying attention to what was happening. And, and thankfully I had some brilliant artists like Billy Hart that were, he's just such a master that uh, he, he deserves that, that kind of listening level. Uh, but the whole, the whole vibe was just different. It felt more significant. Yeah. I'm noticing that from my end here in Kansas city too, there's a different level of, of uh, enthusiasm and interaction with the, uh, with the artist on stage. Where's the best place for folks to pick up red list. And more than that, what can people do to help and to, you know, assist in the funds and, and, and saving these animals and doing the good work you're doing? For the music, you can, you can find the music uh, at all the regular places where it's, you know, either Amazon, uh, you know, Apple, iTunes. There's uh, my website, brianlanders.com. You can get the physical CDs and, and the downloads. Uh, but more to your point, how can people make a difference? I think, the look, you know, I would say if this is int an interesting topic for folks, then look up the IUCD uh, red list. Uh, look up the the creatures that that are endangered, and look up just type into Google the you know most endangered species, and you're going to be shocked that there's a lot of animals you've never heard of, uh, and that and it's the co contributions we can do uh, to help them would be going directly to them. I've been working with a wonderful foundation uh, organization, I should say, uh, save the elephants uh, based they're from the UK, but based in Kenya. And uh, they are doing incredible work to save the African elephant. Uh, and the, you know, they're on, they're on the ground and they're, they're doing things uh, to really, really protect them. There's organizations to save the Javan rhino, which is only 65 left in the world right now. Uh, it's just horrifying. Each one of them have have an armed guard uh, because poachers are coming in and killing them, and they're worth millions of dollars uh, to these people for uh, you know supposed medicinal purposes, which is just bogus all the way around. Uh, so. I would say, you know, contribute to those those organizations and and try to to see what we can do. But really, on the the easiest way to help animals in general is is adopting vegetarian or vegan lifestyle. And I know I have friends that don't want to hear that, 
uh, but it's it's simply the truth. It's the the largest contributor of uh, of fossil fuel emissions in in the world. It's that entire industry. So if people are interested in this, it's there's there's a lot of things you can do. It just uh, by not uh, by not eating meat, by not uh, partaking in that industry. So that's that's an, the amount of uh, land that is taken up for grazing for the animals is is really shocking and sad. And that's uh, putting a lot of these animals um, uh, out out of our world forever. So uh, there's a lot of stuff that we can all do, and some of it is easier than others. And I have to say, when I used to tour as a vegetarian, uh, it was – it was really hard. Uh, and this is going back 15, 20 years, but nowadays there's, it's, it's pretty easy. You know, I, I don't have a problem finding food. Uh, I'm vegan now, uh, but and it's, I never have a problem in finding food that's actually really delicious. So I, I would say that's a, that's a, the, the easiest, most practical thing for most people. Great to catch up with you. Thank you for the music. Good luck with everything. I appreciate it. Thank you for your time, Joe. I really appreciate that. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players and minds in New York City, Kansas City, and spots all over the globe giving fans all that jazz. Thanks to Brian for his time, energy, and cool. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.